So an important aspect to the connection between statistical mechanics and thermodynamics is being able to understand how molecular interactions give rise to the properties of macroscopic quantities of, of matter. And debye huckel theory, and we'll go through it in two videos here, is one means to understand how fundamental interactions affect macroscopic thermodynamic quantities, and in particular, for electrolytes. And so the, the theory carries the name of two different uh, physical chemists or physicists. It depends uh, which crowd you're talking to, who wants to adopt them. Um, Peter Debye on the left and Eric Huckel. And they were both concerned with the question of how do ions distribute themselves in a dilute solution? And being uh, acquainted with physics, of course, they were quite good at making approximations that allow you to make progress. And so the first approximation that they made was, let's assume the ions themselves are point charges. It's easy to work with a point charge. And then let's assume that the solvent, the medium in which your salt is dissolved, can be represented as what's called a dielectric continuum. Right? And so that means that instead of worrying about little solvent molecules, maybe it's water you know, interacting with these ions and being turned in different ways and all the ways you could organize it, Let's erase all those solvent molecules. All that's there is a homogeneous space, but it differs from a vacuum because instead of having the dielectric constant of the vacuum, it'll have whatever the dielectric constant of that medium is. So water has a dielectric constant of 78.3 at room temperature, for example. So that also ought to simplify things. Okay, and so to begin, and to ask that question, where are the ions, let's, let's pick a given ion. So consider a central ion, I'll call it I. And near I itself, the density of ions of opposite charge ought to be enriched compared to opposites of the same charge, right? Because opposite charges attract. And we know that the universe likes to be at lower energy than at higher energy. On the other hand, uh, and, and so the density of ions of like charge is depleted by sort of that same rule. And just to make life simple, let's only think about one anion and one cation. You certainly can have more complicated salts that break apart into different things, but let's, it's going to be complicated enough with just one anion and cation, trust me. Um, so at equilibrium, we ought to get a Boltzmann distribution, right? That's what we know about equilibrium. So if we ask a question about the charge density, that is the charge per unit volume, which I'll indicate by rho, at a given distance r, from the ion I. So that's what I'm going to ask about. What's the charge density around ion I, R away? Well, I'm going to sum over two things. I'm going to sum over the cations, and I'm going to sum over the anions. And so what I want to know is, uh, what is the charge? Because the charge density has units of charge per volume. What's the bulk number density concentration? And then, Here's my energy thing, which is going to either enhance the concentration or decrease the concentration by a Boltzmann weighting, Ke to the minus an energy over Kt. So what will the energy be? It'll be the charge interacting with the electrostatic potential that comes from the ion. All right, so remember, these are the other charges. These are the charges J. So they see some sort of potential associated with that central ion, and there's an energy associated with a charge interacting with a potential. So here's a, a quick little self-assessment to maybe try to make this foundational formula a little more clear, and that is, what do you expect the charge density to be as R grows towards infinity? And given the equation we have, does it satisfy that limit? So take a look at that for a moment. So here's the answer to the self-assessment, namely that there should be no charge density, that is there are equal amounts of positive and negative charge. Remember that no charge density doesn't mean there's no ions, just means there's no preference for any particular ion as you get infinitely far away from a test charge. And the equation uh, speaks for itself and I'll let you take a look at that.
In order to make further progress on this problem, we now need to know something about the potential that appears in that summation. And so the Poisson equation is a fundamental equation of physics that relates the electrostatic potential to charge. And we're working in a uh, convenient system where we're considering a sphere around a central point. And so within spherical coordinates, if you write the Poisson equation, it looks like this. It's 1 over r squared, d dr, r squared, d of the electrostatic potential dr. And so if that looks a little complicated, that's just the form of del squared, the Laplacian, in polar coordinates, spherical polar coordinates, is equal to minus the charge density divided by the permittivity of free space times the dielectric constant of the medium. So that's Poisson's equation expressed in a spherical coordinate system. And if we have a weak potential, right, a weak electrostatic potential, then I can expand this exponential, e to the minus whatever, to be 1 plus minus whatever, so 1 minus whatever. So that's all I've done here. I've replaced e by 1 minus q psi over kt. And so when I put in the 1, I just get sum over the two charges, q sub j times the number density of the charges, minus, and then minus because of this minus symbol. So I expanded to 1 minus this. So this second term, this goes away by electroneutrality, right? The total positive charges times their number density equals the total negative charges times their number density. And so I have this expression for the charge density in terms of the electrostatic potential. If I now make the substitution of this here, I have a differential equation in electrostatic potential. And if I solve that differential equation, which I will not do in gory detail, that's a good subject for a course on differential equations, you get a general solution. You get that the electrostatic potential is equal in general to some constant, capital B over R, e to the kappa R, plus some different constant, A over R, e to the minus kappa R. So either one of those two functions, it turns out, will satisfy the differential equation. Where this term kappa I've introduced saves me some notational details, kappa squared carries all those various constants that we've been working with up till now. Okay, so the number density, the charges, the dielectric constants, and kt. So if you know about differential equations, you can carry out that solution yourself if you like to. Otherwise, let's just take that as a given for our purposes. Now, in order for the potential to go to zero at large r, which is what we want, right? The electrostatic potential of an ion infinitely far away, we know from physics, is zero. It's got to be the case that this constant b is zero because this is a positive number. All these charges squared must be positive. Number density is positive. All of these are positive. So if we add e to positive r as r goes to infinity, that gets big much faster than 1 over r goes to zero. So we've got to get rid of that term, b is zero. And so we're left with only this side. And in order to get Coulomb's law, at infinite dilution, turns out that you can also solve for the value of A. And so A turns out to be the charge on that central uh, ion we've been considering, 4 pi epsilon 0 epsilon, so electrostatic units. And so finally, putting all this together, the point is that the electrostatic potential is charge on I e to the minus kappa r all over 4 pi epsilon 0 epsilon r. So that's the potential that other ions see. Why is that useful? Well, before we look at exactly why it's useful, let's, let's look a little more closely at kappa, which is kind of an interesting quantity. So if you were to work out the units on kappa, you would discover it as units of inverse distance. And if you look at the potential here and think about what it's really doing, what is kappa really doing? As kappa gets bigger and bigger, and how does kappa get bigger? It looks as though kappa gets bigger as the concentration goes up. Right? The charge could go up too, and that, that's an interesting observation. Uh, and obviously we can play a bit with the temperature, but let me think about the salts themselves. 
So as I add more salt to a solution, the concentration goes up, so kappa goes up. So e to the minus kappa r, well, if kappa is getting bigger, e to the minus kappa must be getting smaller. So it says the potential is being killed off with increasing concentration for a given distance from a central ion r. And what that's called is screening. So a charge over here sees less of a charge over here when there are all these other charges in the way. They basically set up compensating charge so that the interaction is reduced. That's known as screening. You're screening, uh, and it comes with increased ionic strength. So this defines the ionic strength, this sum, and we'll see that again uh, soon. In addition, you can show, and I, I won't go through it because it's a kind of a lengthy uh, derivation, but one can show that 1 over kappa, because kappa has units of inverse distance, is the distance at which there's the highest probability of finding an, a counter ion compared to an ion of like charge, right? So it's the point where you are, it's most preferred to have a, an ion of opposite charge compared to an ion of the same charge. And so, given what we've just said about how we can influence kappa, you see things like with sodium chloride, <clears throat> which is a one-to-one -one electrolyte with unit charges, compared to calcium sulfate, which while it's a one-to-one -one electrolyte, would double the charge concentration of each cation and anion. So if you like, a factor of four would come in here. Kappa would, uh, would be reduced by the square root of four, or a factor of two. So it says that the charge cloud shrinks for more highly charged species. And that's an interesting insight, again, into the properties of dilute electrolyte solutions. So I want to play more with Debye-Huckel theory and uh, bring it all the way up to thermodynamics. In this video, mostly, what I wanted to emphasize was being able to use Boltzmann statistics effectively to understand how the ions organize themselves in solution, which ought to give rise to some interesting energetic thermodynamic consequences. Next time, we'll carry the theory a little bit further and finally make a connection with the activity coefficient.